Good morning. I'm Dean Miller. I'm head of Legal Services of New Jersey. I welcome you here today and thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, we have some press representation. We also have some of our friends from the Anti-Poverty Network whom I recognize and very much appreciate coming as well. It's my pleasure to start things off today by introducing former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New Jersey, Deborah Paritz, who now has been kind enough to volunteer her time as chair of the Board of Legal Services of New Jersey. And she'll make some opening and framing remarks. I'll then offer a couple of uh, highlights about uh, what's been what's contained in the report, and then we're going to go to some personal stories from uh, clients of legal services who will talk briefly about the importance of legal services to them, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. So, Chief. Welcome. As Dee just mentioned, um, he will talk to you in some detail about the civil justice gap. This report is Legal Services' inaugural annual report on the shortfall in essential legal aid for New Jerseyans, New Jerseyans living in poverty and the necessary steps to secure equal justice. I would like to speak a little about the justice system and the promise we make to all of the people who live in New Jersey, rich or poor. The commitment to equal justice that to me is a symbol of what is best about us. We make this commitment because of who we are, because we believe in the civil compact that lies at the core of our system of government, and because without it, we cannot have a just society. Yet, realization of equality before the law for everyone, not just for those who can pay for legal assistance, seems an elusive goal. Yes, we have made progress, but the gap remains. And in a recession, the gap grows, as does the need. That is what this report is about, about the need about the people who have been served, and about the many who have not. It is about, in the words of the report, the individual consequences of unrealized legal rights, including homelessness, broken families, loss of children to foster care, arrested development of youth, hunger, unchecked domestic violence, and unaddressed health problems. I believe that it is up to us to do something about this, that we cannot fulfill the promise that we have made unless we do. The Thank you, Chief. The statistics in this report uh, are stunning by any fair, reasonable definition of that term. And it was really the seriousness of the shortfall that led us to this new commitment to an annual accounting to the governor, to the chief justice, to the leaders of the legislature about what the situation is, what's at stake is whether people with civil, serious civil problems that affect their lives, affect their ability to eat and exist, uh, can find the help of a lawyer to guide them through those legal problems. That's it, plain and simple. The bedrock uh, foundation for the report is a 2009 study, social science study that was done with, uh, by Legal Services of New Jersey with assistance from people from Temple University and a professional surveying firm in New York. Some baseline data from that report, one out of three of people in New Jersey, adults between the ages of 
uh, 18 and um, senior status, one out of three have at least one civil legal problem every year for which they need the help of a lawyer. Half of those people, 48, 49 percent, have two or more such problems. So the numbers go up. When you're talking about people below 200 percent of poverty and you're talking about uh, uh, the number of adults who in that group that are experiencing legal problems, you're then over 400,000 people annually. And that number's actually increased since we did the 2009 study because of the effects of the recession. So that's pretty stunning in itself. Of those people who had legal problems, only one-fifth in our study in 2009 were able to get the help of a lawyer. So four out of five could not. And that number with the recession, with the increase in the number of people in poverty and the increase of the number of legal problems experienced by poor people has actually gotten worse. So we're now heading toward, we've left one in five, we're heading toward one in seven. That's what our information now shows. So two thirds of the people who contact legal services have to be turned away because of lack of resources. Not everybody who has a legal problem will even contact legal services for all kinds of reasons. Uh, partly the, 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 the knowledge in the community that legal services is strapped and won't be able to help the majority of people. Recent court data, more recent than 2009, shows an even more dramatic picture, at least in my judgment. This data is compiled annually. The data that we're reporting on here comes from the court year that concluded on June 30th, 2010. So there'll be another segment of data that will become available uh, next year and we'll be reporting on that, including that in the next annual report. But in that data, there were nearly 165,000 tenancy cases uh, involving eviction cases, most of those involved non-payment or rent. In that, uh, in that last court year, the one ending June 2010, of that 165,000, 99% did not have the assistance of a lawyer. Similarly, there were nearly 400,000, 396,195 to be precise, um, defendants in special civil part, which is a civil court of limited jurisdiction, no matters involving amounts greater than 20,000 um, within the New Jersey court system. That's typically where consumer matters, debt collection matters, things that involve low-income people as defendants go on. And of that nearly 400,000 people who were defendants in last court year, again, 99% did not have the assistance of a lawyer. They all needed it. 98% of people in small claims court uh, are without um, represented representation. Small claims court is designed to be a, a place where people can function without lawyers, but they still need legal advice, at least in understanding what the issues are and something about how to approach them. So the numbers are, are, are truly stunning. Uh, they show a choice by society not to fully fund essential legal assistance. Uh, and that's what the basic message in this report will tell you. The, the stories that you will hear from the clients today are stories of the flip side. They are among the privileged who were able to secure the help of legal services and they'll tell you how important that help was to their lives. So uh, we don't have testimony here from people who we couldn't help. If they come into contact, we're, we're going to try to do something for them. We're gonna, at least going to try to give advice, but we, we can't go on and provide full representation. One other statistic I want to leave you with, and then I just want to uh, tell you a little bit logistically about where this report is. Uh, legal services adjusted to the huge cuts. They've, legal services lost. 230 staff people over the last 18 months. 
going from 720 staff statewide to less than 490, and that number's going south. We're at risk of losing at least another 75 in the current calendar year this year. Um, and legal services reacted to it, as I suggested a minute ago, by trying to give at least some help, some advice, uh, however brief it may be, to, to the people that call them. But we cannot found ourselves unable to go to court with people uh, in much greater numbers than was the case in the past. That was the way that legal services programs have first tried to cut with a 35% reduction in legal services funding over the past 18 months. And that drop in the ability to go, go to court is itself stunning. Legal services has reduced by 50% the number of cases in which it can go to court in the last year, in the last 12 months. I just wanna, I don't usually do this, but um, we tried to be succinct in the conclusion to the report, which is on now up on our website. It's, there are copies, hard copies for all of you here, but it's also on our website for you to uh, commend to acquaintances and colleagues. The centuries old, American promise of equal justice elevates legal services from being just another item on the budget buffet, in the words of the current National Legal Services Corporation president, to a moral imperative. Ignoring this imperative has often tragic consequences for the individual and very important and costly implications for society as a whole. Nationally and in New Jersey, the majority, the vast majority of low-income people who are eligible cannot get essential civil legal assistance for critical problems of living, shelter, food, and income, subsistence income, protection, physical protection of themselves. And f from that lack of legal assistance, significant individual and social harm follows. Essential legal assistance is neither charity nor luxury but a commitment of our democracy. Legal Services of New Jersey will update this justice report, uh, justice gap report on an annual basis. I will uh, like to introduce Tricia simpson Curtin from Ellison Jay's staff who will introduce the first of our uh, client uh, test uh, testifiers. And uh, then I'll introduce uh, Bill Rempel and um, Maria LaFace Tara Redmond from the Ocean Monmouth Legal Services Program who will uh, introduce and um, moderate the session with the Ocean Monmouth clients. So Trish. Yeah, uh, my name is Trisha Simpson Curtin, uh, as Dee said, and I'm a writer with Legal Services of New Jersey. Uh, for this project, I had the opportunity and the, the privilege, really, to interview four of our clients um, from Legal Services of New Jersey. Uh, one of them is here with me today. His name is Robert Vasco, uh, and his story is on page 16. But he's going to tell you a little more um, about his life and how he was helped by Legal Services, specifically the SSI project. Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Vasco. I, um, let's see, what can I start? I um, worked my whole life um, as a mechanic, as a cook, as a uh, um, a chef. And uh, at the age of 48 years old, I became sick. I have uh, extreme diabetes and I'm legally blind. I, um, I have seizures, severe seizures, grand mal seizures. They don't know why. Um, I've been to the hospital, had every test possible, but I seem to have like two, three seizures a month. And uh, this prevented me from uh, keeping a job or holding a job or getting a job because people would call up your last employer and find out why I'm not working there anymore. And they would say, well, Robert had a seizure and uh, we, we can't cover him through insurance or we can't cover him through whatever the situation was. 
So <clears throat> I applied for welfare, which I was accepted, and I'm living in a, a fairly decent apartment in Patterson, New Jersey, and they helped me out with food stamps and um, a check a month. Um, at that point, I used up all my savings to paying my rent, and I applied for rental assistance through the state and was accepted, and um, I was getting my rent paid, and after the rent was paid, I would end up with $74 a month to live on. That meant no cable TV, no telephone, no nothing, that's just food. $74 a month. Um, then I decided that I needed to go and apply for some kind of social security disability. And I went back to welfare and they said they would keep paying my rent if I would get a legal aid lawyer um, or apply for a legal aid lawyer, which I did and I was accepted. Um, and back in 19, uh, 2008, um, I got in touch with Scott Wasmuth, who was my, who was my attorney at Legal Aid. The most wonderful man I have ever met in my life. The most caring person you could ever want to speak to. And I'm telling you that from the heart. He cared about everything that I was going through. Um, never, had drug, never had a drug problem. I, I was just a regular person, just like you, you and I. And uh, I couldn't work anymore. Just couldn't do it. I couldn't stand for periods of time. I, I was having seizures. I'm blind, I can't see what I'm doing. I was getting medical help, but I wasn't getting any help as far as living, my living. So Scott um, applied for Social Security for me, SSD, Social Security Disability. And that was back in 78. The first one was applied, I was applied by mail. I was denied. A year later, I reapplied again, because there's a year waiting. I was denied again. And I have all this in writing. All these problems that I have, I had in writing, submitted them to the state, still I was denied. They don't want to give you Social Security if you're 48 years old. Um, applied again third time, and I was denied again. So um, thank God that I had Scott as a lawyer. Um, we had an appearance, a court appearance, down in um, Newark in front of a judge. We went in front of the judge, Judge West was his name, I'll never forget that day. Went in front of the judge, I told him what my problems were, and, and my lawyer was that right there with me. Scott, he had went, to, went to court with me that day, went in front of the judge, told him all these problems that I had and I just can't work. And that day, I didn't hear the, the results that day, but I think it was three weeks later, um, the judge had, had sent me a letter saying that as I was accepted for Social Security. And uh, I was so grateful because there was nothing else I could do. I mean, rental assistance only lasts so long. And it's, you, you know, in my situation, I'm, I'm used to working my whole life, and I, it just it stopped it abruptly. You don't know what to do with yourself. So many things go on through your mind. Um, how are you gonna live? How are you gonna survive? My mother and father both deceased. My brother lives in Florida. My sister lives up in Canada. What are you gonna do? I mean, what do you do to support yourself? So if it wasn't for Scott and the legal aid system, I don't know where I'd be right. I probably wouldn't be dead, honest to God. I probably would have committed suicide after, after all these years of, of not being able to work and, and no income, nothing. So um, today, I'm doing pretty well. I have uh, my Social Security benefits. I have a great insurance, covers all my medical bills. And uh, I'm here, to, when I found out that legal aid was losing funds, I volunteered to come down here today to tell you how important legal aid was to me. There's no way that I would be standing here in front of you if it wasn't for legal aid lawyers because I could never afford to have an attorney. There's no way I could afford it. So I'm here 
as, on behalf of legal aid uh, as gratitude to come down and tell you that I'm very, very grateful in legal aid and I can never, ever have gotten where I am today without their assistance. Thank you. Bill and Maria and their colleagues are staff with Ocean Monmouth Legal Services, which surpri not surprisingly covers the counties of Ocean and Monmouth in New Jersey. Uh, it's one of our six regional programs, a very excellent program with a strong, proud history. So, thank you very much for uh, the uh, nice remarks, Dee. We are, um, we are in, a, in a very difficult year, but thankfully we've, we've been able to open 4,300 cases. And that sounds like a lot but we rejected over 5,000. So today we brought five people that will give you some happy news about what we've been able to do for them. Our first is Barbara Jarman, who I was lucky enough to represent, and I'd like to invite her over here to tell her story. And I'll give a little brief background and then, okay, Ms. Jarman was divorced in about 2000, approximately, after a long marriage. You were disabled and uh, you were awarded a significant amount of alimony, um, and your husband had significant funds. Uh, you got involved with us. How did you get, how did you get involved with us? I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to um, see Judge Flynn, and I realized I didn't have any money, so his law clerk recommended that I see you. And okay. I, I mean, and that's how you got involved, the judge, that's what you call. And then we got involved in the case, and we've been in the case for quite a while, correct? Correct. And tell me about how, how your life was going at the time that um, Mr. your ex-husband was not paying you the support. Okay. Okay. Um, I was basically starving. Okay. Um, living in a one-bedroom apartment without a telephone, without a television, didn't have a car. Um, and was it uh, when you first came to our office in, in Long Branch, I believe? And do you understand, based on the the, uh, the, um, the cuts that are maybe forthcoming, uh, we, we will be required to close our Long Branch office? I understand that. And in the event that we didn't have a Long Branch office, is it true that you may never be able to get our help? Yes. Okay. Um, and it, isn't it true, uh, I know you had a, when I first met you, you had a back brace and you had a lot of other medical issues, but weren't you hospitalized many times during the few months prior to our involvement? For my back, mm -hmm. and also um, whenever I would become really depressed over this situation, I would check myself into Alexander Pavilion at Monmouth mm -hmm. Medical. And, and didn't it come to a point at some time where, where your diet consisted of uh, almost non-human food? Yes. Well, noodles, sometimes fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And wasn't there some times where you were actually hospitalized due to dehydration? Yes. So we got involved in a case, and we took your case through trial, through appeal, and um, we committed to the court that we'll stay involved in your case, correct? Correct. And uh, how have the results been? Very, very good. And, and uh, thank you very much. And where would you be without our help? I wouldn't be standing here. I would be dead. And uh, how do you feel about the potential for more cuts for our office and Ellis and Jay I in general? It, I think it's, it's terrible. And, okay. you know, and you I have, hope that doesn't happen. Do you but. have anything else you'd like to add? You have been fabulous to me, and as humiliating as it is to have to take charity, um, you never made me feel that way, I, and I thank you very much. And thank you for coming, and I, I think yesterday when we finally talked that you said that, uh, I, I agreed to pick you up early this morning, but you had said if I couldn't, I think even in your physical <laughs> condition, you said that you I would. I said if I was on a gurney. That's right. Uh, with my two broken legs right. and two broken arms, I would have had you put me in the back of a yeah. pickup truck. Well, thank I would you be so here. much for coming, and we appreciate it, and thank we'll talk you. to you right after the ceremony. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce Maria LaFace, uh, our Assistant Executive Director and Director of Litigation. She has uh, brought uh, three clients that we were able to help this year, and she'll do a little brief overview with them. Hello everyone. Um, I have, I'm fortunate enough to have three clients here uh, either f who faced homelessness, who, who were in fact homeless, and uh, our agency was able to assist. So I'm going to call them up one by one. Um, David, Cullum, if you wouldn't mind.
This is David Cullum, and David, can you just tell them a little bit about your situation when you came to see us, okay. how uh, we met? Yes. Um, I stood up in front of an audience like this and begged for help because I was at the end of my ropes. Um, I was on special response. I was at the end of uh, their help, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Can you just explain what special response is? Special response is an agency that help homeless people. Uh, they're in Tom's River, and they there. They help you for about a year. During that time, you you seek employment, and I was unable to find employment, and I was at the end of it. And at that time, I was about to be on the street, so I went to a meeting and stood up and begged for help, and she answered that call. Can you just tell them a little bit about what we were able to do for you? They was able, able to uh, extend the help from um, special response for another year, and during that time, hopefully, I can find a job and be able to pay for rent and everything else. Uh, and if we hadn't stepped in, David, where do you think you'd be today? Hmm. I'd be on the street. Um, I'd be back in Camden doing what I usually do, I guess, because I, I got to support myself, and I don't know another way besides support myself, besides that, if I can't get work the right way, there's the streets. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to add, or I just want to thank um, you for coming? I appreciate the agency help, and without them, me, and there's a lot of people like me that need their help and couldn't, wouldn't, they couldn't get their help because of the cut. And a lot of them come to me and say, listen, I went to them and tried to get some help, couldn't get the help because they wouldn't help me. And come to find out because of the cut, a lot of people couldn't get help. And I'm happy that I was able to get the help I need. And, and I beg y'all to give them the funding that they need to be able to help more people. Thank you. Uh, the next gentleman I'd like to call up is Jason Cameron. This is Jason. Uh, Jason was also a client of our office, and if you could just tell them a little bit about how you came to find out about us and what we were able to do for you. I was recommended by a friend. I was already homeless. I was living in my, in my car, unfortunately. Um, I was thrown out of the house and all I had was my vehicle. I had nothing else. I had no money with me. I had no food. And without the legal services, I most likely, I would have been dead by now. What were we able to do for you? Well, I was on emergency response. You were able to get me a motel room. Okay. And I was able to actually be a human being again. And how are you today? <sighs> I'm a lot better to thank God. Without legal services, I, I, I would have been dead. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for coming. We appreciate thank it. You. I know it wasn't easy. And finally, uh, we have Ralph Bees, if I've said it right, Ralph. All right, Ralph, you know the drill. Yes. Can you tell them a little bit about yourself and what we were able to do for you? Um, well, as David said, I was on special response also, and uh, my year was also up. And um, Pagin Zelinsky, mm -hmm. who is not here, she helped me um, fill out paperwork that I didn't understand because I am in um, Ocean Mental Health, and they helped me with Medicaid so I can get my medication. I'm in programs now, you know, to help me with my mental health and um, to fill out paperwork for Social Security and um, get me an extension through social services so, you know, I wouldn't be homeless, you know, out on the street and, um, you know, have food. And what do you think would have been the outcome if we weren't able to assist you? <laughs> Living on the street, you know, maybe couch to couch at friends' houses. You know, I, I really don't, I wouldn't know. What, you know. And how are you today as a result of our system? I'm fine today, you know, um, I'm six months you know,
clean, sober, and um, my mental health state, you know, is steady, you know, with the medication and all. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell everyone or? Just uh, hopefully that, you know, this funding, you know, can, can go on so other people can get helped, especially families, you know, Thank that you, are living sir. on the street. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Maria. Three, three very nice stories and three good outcomes. Uh, I really have no reason to introduce Tara Redman. She's a very experienced lawyer with our office and has done a wonderful job since the day she started here. But I would like to let the uh, audience know um, that this was a case that commingled the efforts of both OMLS and LS&J and shows the reason that our cohesion is so good. And Tara and the clients will speak about that. Uh, Tara and Mr. and Mrs. Bennis, come on up. And I'd first like to thank you for taking the time to listen to these testimonials or stories because as we may think of them as stories, um, these are our clients' lives that we're discussing today. My clients are Barbara Bennis and her husband is Bill Bennis standing here with her today. Uh, Bill Bennis was represented by Joanne Mance from Legal Services of New Jersey uh, and Barbara Bennis was represented by Ocean Mammoth Legal Services and it was a co-effort. Um, Bill and Barbara, you are the parents of a daughter born in 1993, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And from the moment of her birth until 2009, for 15 years of her life, you had never experienced the joy or pleasure of having her in your home or having any visitation with her that wasn't we supervised had, by another adult, is that right? We yes. had very limited supervised visitation very limited and um, we were even denied visitation at one point for a few years on something false and until we got Tara in our on our case we have no idea how to act in court or how to represent ourselves we couldn't have done that but um, with Tara and a couple Joanne Mance and another lady from that represented our daughter um, we got some such good help that in a little more than six months we had our daughter home, and um, we got, before that we got a visitation that was not supervised for the first time. We didn't feel like a criminal anymore. We, we know we're not, but it's a, an awful feeling. And um, we actually so got just, overnight. If I could just interrupt you, okay, I'm sorry. Overnight. So for 15 years you hadn't had any unsupervised visit with her, is that right? Right. Yes. And then in about February of 2009, you came into contact with my office. Do you yeah. recall how that happened? I think Dr. Coffey, who was um, evaluating myself, my husband, and my daughter, uh, is the one who contacted uh, Tara, and uh, plus also my daughter's law guardian might have contacted her. Okay. And um, you had stayed in contact with Erin through the course of her lifetime, of course. We and used a lot of money just to keep her in our lives. We, that was all we, we were hanging in there. Yes. And, um, in February of 2009, we got involved in the case along with Ms. Mance. I think we referred you, Bill, up to Ms. Yes, Mance. Yes, I believe right? you did, yeah. And we drove up there and uh, met with her, and she was very interested in the case and was willing to represent me. So by March of 2009, I think it was maybe a week afterwards, we got the case scheduled for court, and we got you on supervised visitation with Erin right away. Yeah. Yep. And then in April, um, one month later, um, you began having unsupervised, more unsupervised visitation yeah. and overnight visits, is that right? Yeah, for, it was the best thing that happened in our lives. We, it was unbelievable. We had our daughter home with us. Then in, uh, I think, July, you got her four nights overnight per week? Yes. It's okay. And on August 17th, I know Bill has that date <laughs> sort of etched in his mind, yeah. er, uh, your daughter yeah. came, came home, home. Yes. for the first time, is that right? And can yes. you tell us a little bit about how that felt? Uh, it was Beyond anything we could imagine. The day we uh, got custody of her, um, when the judge wrote out, you know, did the order to give us custody, um, I thanked everybody that was involved in the courtroom, and I actually broke down, you know, after almost 17 years of 
uh, legal wrangling and fighting. Fifteen. Fifteen, yeah. Um, to, to say the, the kind of work that you and Joanne did, um, we fought the legal system for 15 years, and in the space of six months, you got her home to us. So that, to a me, that more. says a heck of a lot about your abilities. And Well, you guys did all the work. <laughs> no, you did a lot of work. We couldn't do it ourselves. There's no way. We, we would have to wait till she's 21 because she's special needs, and the, she might have been in lockup. We might have never gotten her because if, once they get into lockup, Baron got out of control from being in the system a long time, and she could have been in lockup for the rest of her life. So, And she is um, home with you. I believe litigation, the actual case itself, was closed out completely yes. by October yeah. of that same year. Yes. And um, how, is, is, how is everything going at home? Wonderful. Fantastically. And where do you think, if you can imagine um, the possibilities, I, I don't know, where do you think, what do you think would have happened if you hadn't gotten attorneys through Legal Services of New Jersey and through Ocean Mama? I think Erin would have been in lockup. She was getting out of control, and they couldn't handle her any longer. And the last foster home was the last step she would have, if she didn't make it there, she would have been in lockup. And she was misbehaving there, but the people were helping her. A lot of people were helping her, and she finally um, started cracking down a little and listening. So. We would, have, we would have never gotten her, though, without uh, legal services. There's no way. We couldn't do it on our own. We were kind of resigned to the fact that we probably wouldn't have ever gotten custody of her and that she probably wouldn't have come home to us until age 21. And as my wife said, that might not have even happened because of her behavior and uh, the fact that she uh, uh, kind of fought the uh, the foster home system and so forth and uh, she, was in so she, many she homes. may have been in lockup or a boarding home or something so you think legal services made an impact oh absolutely. absolutely we wouldn't have her today if it wasn't like for you. i said you Thank guys you. performed a miracle in six months that nobody else could do in 15 years and, and thank you for sharing your life and, and thank your you. story with everyone. Thank you, with, thank with you with for all your thank help. Thank you. Yeah. You're a wonderful lady. Thank you so much to each of you who shared your um, stories today. I really appreciate it. We're going to close now uh, before uh, an opportunity for uh, anybody to talk individually with, with the clients who, who might seek to do so with a video which runs about 18 minutes which was prepared to uh, talk about the justice gap. It represents the perspectives of our, for the most part, of our individual board members of the Legal Services of New Jersey uh, five former justices of the New Jersey Supreme Court among them um, and uh, other leaders of the bar of New Jersey on the consequences of the justice gap. Today, Legal Services of New Jersey announces the transmittal to the three branches of state government, as well as the release to the general public, of a new and comprehensive report concerning the status of civil legal assistance, the ability of those New Jerseyans living in poverty to secure the necessary help of a lawyer for their civil legal problems. The purpose of this assessment is to make New Jersey policy makers aware of the extent as well as the consequences of the unmet need for civil legal assistance in this state. Legal Services of New Jersey will update this report every year. This guy that we knew said he had a house for sale. He showed us the house and said, um, were, were we interested in buying the house? And then we were like, um, yeah, but not at this moment because we wanted to get our credit right. So he was like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll be able to get you, you know, the house or whatever. So. 
we had went through the process of getting the house and after the initial closing he um we saw that we had two mortgages legal services really helped us yes. and really listened to us and really never judged us and you know we really they need those patient. services they were patient with us mm. and um they just listened to us, you know, and they really, really helped us. And, and we don't know what we would have did if it wasn't we, for we legal very, services. We're very, very thankful for legal services being on our side and helping us out in our time of need. Because but I got, like, like you said, I don't know what we would have done. We probably wouldn't be here. Mm -mm. Legal aid saved my life because when it wasn't for Scott, I never would have got my social security because we tr I tried and tried, applied three times, I was denied. From its earliest communications to its citizens, our society promises equal justice for all. Justice is the goal of this country. It's been that way ever since the founding fathers crafted the charter document. Uh, you can't have justice unless you have access to justice. People in need particularly need our help. People in need need access to the justice system. They are being evicted from their homes. Uh, we have to deal with foreclosures. People don't know how to get the resources that are available. If we do not provide legal services through the legal services system to these people, we, we, we're making a judgment. We're making a judgment that we can abandon um, many people who, who have these needs and that we can move on and ignore what's actually happening. We need people to have access to the legal system, to have faith in the legal system and to trust it. The problem for the poor these days who don't have access to legal services, to an attorney, in a moment of, of dire need, in a moment of crisis. It's not a question of equal justice because the inference with equal, the phrase equal justice is discrimination, that everyone should be treated alike. But the problem is not equal justice on the law, it's justice. In other words, if they don't have an attorney to represent them, it's not a question of getting equal justice, it's having access to the justice system in a meaningful way in the first instance. At the end of the day, we're interested in justice. And justice only works when evidence is fairly presented to a court so that, the, so that the judge or jury, in the event that there's a jury involved, can make a fair determination on the facts and on the evidence and render a fair and just result. calling and I remember the attitudes of certain people in, in disability and they still didn't believe that he was sick. So uh, if, if we didn't have an attorney involved, I really don't believe we would have gotten this far. The report reveals a continuing and widening civil justice gap in New Jersey. One out of every three adults living in poverty in this state faces at least one civil legal problem requiring the help of a lawyer each year. The great majority, five out of every six, will not be able to receive such legal assistance. More than seven out of eight of the civil legal problems of the poor must be faced without the help of a lawyer. Court data reveals that 99% of eviction defendants, almost all of them poor, and 99% of special civil part defendants, mostly people in poverty, are not represented by an attorney. Of those 99% who are not represented by an attorney, in some instances, people have not paid their rents because the places where they are living are not habitable. They're infested with bugs, with roaches, with water that doesn't work. 
any number of other things. And under the law of New Jersey, this is an excuse not to pay your rent. Yet those 99% of people who are unrepresented in landlord-tenant cases who fall below the poverty line are not represented and do not even know that these are defenses they can raise. I think they feel them in their heart, which is why they didn't pay rent in many instances. But the simple fact of the matter is, unless they assert them, there's no way a court can consider them. I think, you know, I think the justice gap is, you know, unlike the missile gap we had in the 1960s, is a real gap. And it's something that we as a society need to address, and we need to address it sooner rather than later. This is at a crisis state. This is not something that's hypothetical, that something might happen. It is happening. This report demonstrates the reality, and we as a society must do something to address this systemic, prevalent, and I submit, unjust reality. You know, I used to go feed the homeless uh, with my group, and, and I always say, you know, man, everybody is one paycheck away from being here, and those were the most truest words I ever said, because one day, I was basically homeless. Everything was taken away from me. Without lawyers, few are able to succeed in facing a legal problem on their own especially where court is involved. Many lower income people could have avoided the worst consequences from their legal problems, such as eviction, foreclosure, violence, hunger, broken families, if they had had the assistance of a lawyer. People need lawyers, and ha getting a lawyer doesn't mean just having someone available to talk to. Many people consult with lawyers for their advice, but they need more than advice. They need more than just information. Most of the time, people in low-income situations, as, as others, need a lawyer who will go to court with he or she to defend their rights. There's a lot of human misery out there, and a lot of it can be reduced if a person has a lawyer and can defend himself or herself against claims which are not meritorious. You have to consider that poverty is both a cause and a consequence of underrepresentation in the legal arena. That is to say, poor people cannot afford legal representation, but by not being able to afford legal representation, there's also the consequence of it contributing to that cycle of poverty. So poverty is both a cause and a consequence of underrepresentation in this country. It is uh, a difficult problem that has to continue to, to be addressed. Because you can't tell people they can't have anything. They have, to, they have to have a subsistence. They have to be able to feed their families. They have to be able to to again participate in a, in a vibrant society in order for the society to be successful. Homeless people, people that don't have food, heat, they don't realize what a, 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 a task that is unless you have been in that position. The difference between just getting by in a poverty situation, but just getting by, but getting by, and sleeping in the railroad station is a very fine line. It doesn't always look that way in, in the way people live and conduct themselves, but many people are just on a, on a brink. And a bad legal situation, a situation where they had rights, but they really weren't, weren't protected or prosecuted, um, and being homeless and on the street it is a very, very fine line. When we leave people out of the mainstream, for example, those who are unemployed, uh, those who are homeless, we create those who end up in the criminal justice system because they've been unemployed or are homeless, we end up creating additional costs to society that might otherwise uh, be eliminated. The cost to society uh, for those folks that don't get the legal aid 
probably is a higher figure and a much greater expense than if they had had counsel from the very beginning of their problems. I think it's important for us to understand that in the end, society is served when people are able to vindicate their interests in a court of law. Cuando mi hija uh, tenía la edad de 11 años, eh, me di cuenta de que ella empezó a paralizar la mitad del cuerpo. Eh, no sabían qué tenía. Al año la diagnosticaron con multiplosclerosis. Con el paso del tiempo eh, fue incrementando sus ataques a su cerebro. Ahorita paré el trabajo cuando ella ingresó al hospital por una larga temporada. En el mayo del año pasado, del 2010, a mi hija le quitaron el seguro. Eh, yo lloraba porque en ese entonces mi hija estaba tomando quimioterapia. Mi hija dependía de unas inyecciones. Eh, esas inyecciones eh, ahora sí que estaban más caras que la hipoteca de mi casa. Me estaban costando $3,800. Dos inyecciones. Llamé a Sara, a Mario y ellos me buscaron rápido ayuda. Ese mismo día que llamó, ese mismo día me dieron el seguro. Fueron, como le digo, fueron unos ángeles que se aparecieron en mí y muy importante. Legal Services is New Jersey's statewide system for providing civil legal assistance to the poor. It's important that the rights of people whose income is lower do, in fact, have the assistance of legal services. Legal services in New Jersey, but really around this country, is something people, I think, don't often fully appreciate. The right for a civil lawyer is just as important, in my view, as the right for a criminal lawyer. We don't have that requirement, so we have to rely on the structure. The structure that has worked best in New Jersey for 40 years is legal services on a local basis and on a statewide basis. The help that legal services gives is essential help for these people. Technology, such as phones, video, internet, and portable devices, enables legal services to provide some assistance, but not full representation, to over 1.2 million New Jerseyans annually. There are a lot of things that can be done to make the situation better. A lot of them have been done. Uh, greater efficiency in delivery, whether that's through technology or simply better, more common sense ways of doing things. Uh, legal Services always is trying to, to address those kinds of innovations, really. Sometimes they're very simple. They don't, they're not like inventing a light bulb, but they are very important. Pro bono contributions from private attorneys are an important resource for Legal Services, but they are in no way sufficient to provide all necessary civil legal assistance to those living in poverty. I mean, our view is that every lawyer should do some pro bono work in some fashion. I think there is an obligation on the legal profession, which is the, the lawyers are officers of the court. They're in a profession that professes justice and fairness for people. And I think uh, we need to return some of what we do as lawyers and get as lawyers to people who, who need it. Look, I think that a, I think there are a fair number of firms which already do that, but it's a drop in the bucket. They can't possibly fill in the gap that's created by the diminution in resources of legal services. Attorneys may, may be willing and, and able to volunteer certain hours, but they certainly can't carry the cost of trying a case. Trying a case is very expensive. Social injustice are not mere violations of the law. That is to say, pro bono attorneys, while they may be well-intentioned, are not going to be able to get at the, the systemic problems that create social injustice. Social injustice is created by deeply entrenched economic and institutional forces. 
Uh, because it's systemic, it's going to require a, a systemic and systematic approach to eliminate it. In the end, only additional funding will secure civil justice for the poor. We have a, an infrastructure that's already there that can provide access and that, if adequately funded, could do a great deal to bridge the justice gap. Funding is a means to get to a goal. Dollars certainly help. Uh, there's no question about that. The, uh, the better the fund, uh, the more you're able to help a greater uh, pool of persons that are in need. But at the state level in New Jersey, uh, our two primary sources of funding have been uh, interest on lawyers' trust accounts and uh, state um, appropriations. Interest on trust accounts has gone the way of interest rates, virtually zero. We've had roughly an 80% decline in that outside source of funding for legal services. State appropriations were cut last year by one third. Simultaneously with the reduction in support for legal services, the demand and need for legal services has, has increased uh, sharply. The gap has always been severe and it's, it's worse now than ever because just as the time when the clients need more help, our resources are being cut back. Whether you're a Republican, whether you're a Democrat, liberal, or a conservative, that you can't get together and take, take care of those that need it the most. We have to find the funds. This is something that if it fails, our legal system will fail in my, my, my humble judgment.